I'll keep going. There's another. Better flip all of those. They seem to all be out. Now we're back. Again, this is the original kind of competition drawings of the um, that main floor where you can actually see all that stuff that we couldn't show in the other ones. Um, next slide. This is a view in the lobby, this very low lobby, with these very large columns uh, kind of forcing you towards the big stair and up. Lobby is very disappointing in a lot of ways. Needed color, particularly in this very low ceiling. Uh, they were a very resistant client. In fact, would not let us do any of the furnishings, took all the furnishings away from us. He towed a lot of the interior detailing in the building. Uh, there was a lot of fighting in this job, uh, including our kind of walking on the job a couple times. Uh, it was a contentious five years. Next slide. Some of the original detailing of that lobby that didn't get done with its color, in watercolors. That's some of the original furniture designs that didn't get done. Next one. A detail again. The bookstore elevation within the lobby. And in the lobby, you carry the exterior limestone in to the public space uh, with very large uh, joints. Next slide. Some of the earlier conceptual ideas of the ceiling of that lobby, so that when you look up into this kind of indirect uh, cove lighting situation, you get all this kind of color uh, to kind of relieve the lowness of it. Didn't happen. Next slide. Then as you make the turn, you're looking through the, the glass wall towards the old building outside and the big stairs taking you up to the galleries beyond. Next slide. The same view, looking down with the square off in the distance. And then the interior wall, also done in stone, with the galleries beyond to your right. The, the landing is at the mezzanine level. Next slide. Same view where you can look back into the galleries a bit through these kind of inside-outside windows, which they did let us do. Uh, that was the only windows we were allowed. They do give you some view from inside the galleries. We always like to do that in all our museums, since you're not totally isolated. But you can relate back to the real world on some level from within the world of art. And so, and one, just to kind of orient yourself so you know where you are in these mazes that these big museums become. And two, just because of the kind of wonderful uh, uh, juxtaposition of the inside and the art and the real world outside. Next slide. Again, Nelson and the facade of the original building through the stairwell. Next slide. You can see that kind of night very dramatically. We did kind of screw up. I mean, they wouldn't let us have a light enough glass in the stairwell. So during the day, it really reads quite dark because of the tin and much too monolithic. Uh, at night, it reads much more the way you'd like it to read, where you really do read the inner wall beyond the glass wall with its inscriptions and its inner windows juxtaposed to the, the front. Next slide. Here's a detail then in the original competition drawings of the uh, uh, of that stair, uh, which is which it's, uh, writing and all the, the stone layout. Next slide. This is the original conceptual sketch of that kind of forest perspective, uh, Renaissance perspective, taking you at the top of the stairs to your left into the galleries, with each arch getting slightly smaller so that the pictures kind of push out into it. At least that was the original concept of it. Uh, then the top lighting and whatnot from above. Next slide. A view of that. Next slide. Another view. The curators, we had very little say about the hanging of these rooms. Uh, we weren't asked, and we were pretty well kept out of it. Uh, it's, you know, a lot of curatorial stuff about this kind of stuff is the most w weird pseudoscience these days. You know, pictures are exactly 6.2 feet apart. And, you know, I have all these rules of thumb. They're just kind of insane, you know, it's because most museum curators are about the least visual people you'll ever deal with in your life. And, and so, you know, some of the things that could have happened in terms of more kind of the architecture and the paintings kind of 
complementing each other never happened. Uh, but it basically works, this, this vista works the way it was designed, except you don't have the pictures pushing in from the left and right as well as much as we would have liked to, to give you a hint of the different kind of layers of galleries in depth as you look down and through this. All this kind of detailing, you know, it's caught a lot of flack in England of, you know, the kind of partial, uh, you know, detailing of these uh, kind of impacted columns. Uh, the proportion of them is not very classically correct. Uh, it's more Bob than it is classicism. And the way they're sheared off, you know, and, and kind of dealt with in a scenographic sort of way has gotten the classicists all really mad at us. Next slide. Because English class, and here's the view from the old building as you come through and this axis that we're looking down stretches a you know literally 500 feet behind us all the way through every gallery to you know the other end of the museum uh, that we're looking out from behind where this picture is taken next slide again some of the off-axis views of that renaissance axis where you begin it breaks down obviously very quickly as you move to the left and the right uh, and you get the play of the different layers of, of ornament within the room and within the axis and then they drop away very quickly because the rooms are quite severe uh, with just a top molding and a bottom molding um, and the Pietro Siena stone uh, you know very simple uh, very laid back we'll look at them in section in a minute next slide again a detail of the play of those different levels of ornament next slide another one just keep going The way this works in section is rather interesting, and it's it's based basically on uh, Soane's Dulwich Gallery, uh, which is a beautifully small top-lit gallery from the early 19th century, uh, or late 18th, I forget which, uh, that basically lets light in from above, bounces it around, and then kind of filters it down. Now, the reason for that is one technical because you aren't for conservation reasons they won't let you have any direct sunlight going into these rooms so in effect the whole roof structure is a double layered light baffle where you're all the visible skylights are merely letting light into giant kind of rooms up there where it bounces around and then eventually bounces indirectly through the what the the, the sash that you actually see in windows in the galleries themselves and then that's all part of an immensely complex computer controlled system which is made up of very fancy uh, incandescence, natural light controlled by computer driven louvers and, and fluorescent system as well up in that space. And the computer basically monitors every five minutes what the indoor and outdoor light is and kind of moves this whole thing. So that in effect it allows the cloud to go over the sun and you feel the cloud going over the sun because that happens quicker than the, than the kind of sensing time. So if a cloud comes over, you actually feel it in the gallery that yes, in fact, you know, that's real light. In point of fact, only about 20% of the light in the room is real natural light. Everything else is fake um, to create the illusion of natural light. Uh, and then in turn, as the light levels in the winter, which are abysmal in England, you know, where it's cloudy and rainy and very dark, a lot of that is kind of uh, becomes natural light. But rather seamlessly, you're never quite aware of the change because it's all being kind of computer monitored and driven. Uh, it's quite a subtle lighting thing, probably the most sophisticated lighting system that's ever been put into a, you know, into a contemporary museum. Uh, and it's probably the thing that's gotten the biggest raves, I guess, about the building, since everybody hates the architecture and everybody loves the galleries. Next slide. Again, the plan, next slide. Let's just keep going on a repeat term. Some of the early design drawings of that view this is the, the second axis. We, we're standing in the Renaissance axis looking down the long cross axis through the building rooms and suite. Originally, there was to be a window at the end of that axis that looked back out to the square again to kind of, again, kind of cue you in. It was a gigantic fight with the um, curators. They wanted to put some dinky little altarpiece. Uh, curators cannot let go of an axis. They always want to jam an altarpiece into an axis. And of course, most of these altarpieces, in fact, that are in the museums were in little chapels. They weren't in giant naves of big churches. They were in teeny little, you know, provincial churches in little chapels. So it's kind of stupid. And in fact, the one they put, so they would never let us put this window in, although the wall's detailed. And, and uh, a lot of people say that someday they'll, they'll 
restore the window. It desperately wants it. Uh, there's this teeny little altarpiece you'll see in a minute at, at the end of this axis. Above, then, you can see the kind of uh, the light monitor with the kind of uh, beveled walls, kind of the transitional walls uh, between the, the hanging wall and the light monitor above. Next slide. Here's what actually is this teeny little altarpiece at the end of the axis. Next slide. They didn't see the difference between that and the first one. There it is, kind of. Oh no, that's looking the other way, where there's actually a bigger altarpiece. It doesn't works pretty well looking the reverse direction because there actually is an altarpiece big enough at that end to actually hold the axis. Next slide. Here again, you can see those big light monitors, the out the outside uh, skylight, the big diffusing chamber, which is also the mechanical plenum. Uh, in fact, one of the most interesting spaces in the building, which nobody ever gets to see, is this kind of wonderful kind of loft, industrial loft. It was this, this giant light box, in effect, at the, uh, sitting on top of this thing. And you kind of walk through that, and you can kind of peer down into to the galleries below. It also means that it makes it very easy to, to, to work all the lighting equipment, because you don't have to get up on ladders in the galleries. You literally can handle every one of the, the, the individual incandescent lights can be kind of focused and, and held and worked on from up within that gallery. Here then you can see the, the sub, the basement stuff down below grade, your entry level, your very low mezzanine restaurant level, and then your gallery level. Next slide. Again, this is the teeny little altarpiece at the end of the grade axis, the light coming from above. In this you can get a sense of the different color temperatures of light. It's a very difficult building to photograph because in fact there's three different color temperatures of light which you know your eye doesn't register but the film does so you can see like right now the top of this is very daylit but the actual wall is obviously incandescent because it's starting to go yellow in the photograph which uh, is the, the color temperature of the incandescent light obviously to your eye it doesn't read that way the way this photograph does when you're there but the kind of very careful detailing of rooms like this you know the this is the Pietro Sane or surrounds the way the molding just tips into the vista, all those kind of things. I mean, just thousands and thousands of hours goes into working out that kind of subtle uh, perspective and classical detailing. Next slide. Here's one of the cross axis windows. This is one of those windows within the stairwell, uh, which has a bench within it and then has this diffuser on it a lot of the day so you don't get any direct light through it. But then you see the ornament of the original the facade beyond of the of the building, of the uh, of the Wilkins building. Next slide. Another view of those windows along the stairwell. Next slide. One of the side vistas, one of those diag kind of oblique vistas, where the doors are not lined up and not arched like the main doors of the central galleries. Next slide back to the central axis, but you're looking at it off axis, so you get these weird scale juxtapositions of the different scale size columns. Next slide. And of course, this is the way you really see the building, and it's, I mean, that's the problem with most architectural photography. It's, it's you know, it's taken without people in it, and, you know, this, the detailing in a building like this is, you know, really dependent and designed around the idea of the hordes of people that are going to be juxtaposed against it. And it has to have enough guts and enough scale and enough toughness to look good in this context rather than the one we've been looking at it in. Next slide. Where they always look good. Um, next slide. Again, some of those details, which we love so much, but a lot of people hate. The, the detail of the incised letter, uh, the granite of the, of the um, step itself, the limestone and the Pietro Serena uh, col uh, you know, cap uh, comp base of the, one of the perspective columns, and then how that's sheared off and impacted into the next column. I mean, you know, it takes somebody, just to give you an idea, it probably, you know, one person probably spent a year just, I yeah, know he did, he spent, one guy spent a year just dealing, detailing that perspective axis. The, you know, the way every stone came together and then how that worked mathematically to size every stone to, to diminish within the perspective is one person's work for a whole year. Next slide. The top of one of those columns. Next slide. This is the way you do that kind of detailing. It's all done full size. These are full size computer plots. That's the great virtue of the CAD is it allows you to do 
you know, every detail can be plotted out full size and hung up on the wall. And literally, you know, there were hundreds of full size foam core details all over the office for a couple of years, plus two dimensional drawings of full size details just draping every surface. Because you really have to do this stuff at full size. You can't do it, uh, at, you know, kind of eighth inch to the foot. Um, next slide. That's just a detailing of a door. This is a this is the design of a bench which never got built. Uh, done full size in foam core. Next slide. Uh, some early sketches uh, for a bench design, one of the banquettes and bench designs. Again, with both section of you know, of relief of all of this and, and elevation all done in the same kind of sketch. Next slide. This is the one piece of furniture we got in the whole building, which was a kind of information desk. It's the only piece that we actually designed. Next slide. And then back again. Next slide. Back out to the square. Next slide. I think that's the last one. I, you know, it's just the, I mean, this is like what you're looking at. It's six years, six years effort you know, from the kind of competition phase to when this thing opened. Um, you know, just an immense amount of blood, sweat, and tears. And in some ways, a compromised building. There's a lot of things. I mean, the basic idea of the building held up and got built. There were a lot of fights and everything, but it got built. And I think, you know, we're awfully proud of it. But in a lot of ways, given the nature of the site, the kind of political constraints, this is in some ways a, you know, a very laid back sort of building. It, you know, it offends the modernists because it's got classical detailing. And it offends the classicists because it's, you know, the, the classical detailing is kind of uh, distorted in a very modern way, in a very, quote, non-traditional way. And, and British classicism now has become totally doctrinaire. Uh, you know, so many of them are into this, including the prince, into this kind of biblical, holier than now classicism where, you know, there's only one way to do it. Uh, and it somehow, you know, was passed down uh, with the Holy Grail. Uh, and it's extremely dry and very dead and, 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 and profoundly uh, reactionary, to put it bluntly, both politically. And the trouble with these guys who are doing it, most of the English. It's a political movement. I mean, these guys are just one step up from fascists who are touring most of these classical villains, including the Prince. Uh, and, and obviously, you know, that isn't her attitude towards classicism, and it certainly isn't our politics. And so, uh, you know, this building represents, a, you know, a much more, in our feeling, truly British tradition of classicism, which is a much more eclectic, open-ended, and free use of classicism, reinterpreting it constantly. Uh, to a different era and a different set of conditions, including peace marches. Next slide. Now, I'll quickly run through some stuff on the Seattle building. The Seattle building is interesting because, in some ways, it didn't have all the political problems of the National Gallery. We had much more freedom and much more client support to do the building. Um, and we had much greater control over the building, both inside and out, in the end. Well, and in some ways, therefore, it's a, a more successful building, I think, um, because it didn't have to kind of get filtered through committees. You didn't have to put, um, for instance, in England, one of those Corinthian uh, columns that we just looked at would go before a committee where they'd vote on the correctness of your Corinthian detailing. I mean, that's what really offended Bob. I mean, he basically said, look, you know, you as the client have every right to ask me to redesign this 100 times until I get it right you know, programmatically, functionally, et cetera, et cetera, to meet your needs. But when it comes to the detailing of a Corinthian column, you know, I know more than you'll ever forget about that. What the hell did you hire me for if you think you know how to do it better than me? If you think you do, you sign the drawings. Uh, and so, you know, it, it was just battle after battle. Whereas in Seattle, uh, the client was smart enough uh, to say, look, you know, you're my architect. You know how to do these things. Uh, you do it. Um, now, the inspiration for the Seattle building in a lot of ways comes from uh, the tradition. This is a series of details of the Philadelphia Art Museum uh, that obviously Bob grew up with as a kid in Philadelphia. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's a kind of wonderful uh, kind of <laughs> classicism and, the, and the, you know, where you get the, all the wonderful polychrome. They only had enough money to do one entablature in, in, in Philadelphia. So you only can see this when you look one direction uh, to the eastern uh, uh, pediment, basically. Uh, 
but you know that kind of tradition of the kind of beautiful use of color within the pediment and within the ornament uh, all terracotta most of it in here um, was one that you know we seemed we really wanted to do something with in Seattle. I mean, the actual representation, as you'll see in a moment, is quite different and certainly not as uh, straight as it is in this Philadelphia example. Next slide. I mean, here is the representation of the whole ground floor ornament, where it becomes much more abstract, much more two-dimensional, um, and much more, but still within that tradition, the idea and in a sense, kind of inverted the tradition. It's not at the top of the building anymore, it's at the base of the building, because this is a really windowless museum. The National Gallery had a few windows in the galleries, uh, but because of the nature of the collection in this museum, they wanted absolutely no natural light, the curators. It all had to be artificial. Uh, and so the only windows in this building are in the lobby and then in some of the offices on the very top of the building has none of the kind of wonderful natural lighting through the uh, roof that we were able to do in the National Gallery. Next slide. It's, again, a classic downtown museum, but in the American grid sense. Um, not on a, you know, Trafalgar Square. It's just another block in downtown Seattle. Pike Street Market is kind of off to the left and upper part near the water there. Uh, big new high-rise office buildings all around it. A kind of funky uh, First and Second Avenue are basically funky commercial street. Uh, First Avenue still has you know strip joints, uh, and in fact, the, when the, when this opened, the strip joint across the street of it, from it, put up a sign saying "The Lively Lady Welcomes Art to First Street." Uh, the, uh, so you know, this is a real classic American downtown. And you know, the museum is basically relocating from a building out in a park uh, on the edge of town, on the lake, right downtown for all the obvious reasons. And this is all part of that same kind of uh, thing of marketing art, uh, which is a real big deal these days. You know, this is big business. Uh, the bookstores, the number of people that they want to draw by being downtown. Uh, the setback, every other building here is built right out to the street. Uh, Seattle's kind of the ultimate kind of urban design bullshit city in the United States. Uh, and the urban designers decided that they were going to have these giant vistas on, uh, on all the streets that run uphill. In other words, these University Street, Union Street, Pine Street, they're all very steep. You're running from the water up quite steep um, against the hillside. And all of those were to be widened in order to give vistas to the water. Crazy idea because you know what it's going to take a hundred years before all the buildings on those streets are torn down and rebuilt with these setbacks. So poor little art museum is the only one that has the setback in all this thing, giving up all. You know, it's it's like a crazy urban design idea about the the city grid, American city grid. Because obviously, without that setback, you see down to the water because of the elevation, perfectly all right. I mean. Uh, it's just kind of the sort of stuff that urban designers get into when they try to trick up the gridiron city. But anyhow, so it has this setback. It has a kind of curved, inflected facade because it's a very small building surrounded by bigger buildings. So you're trying to at least tie the two facades together to give a thing bigger scale uh, in the city. Next slide. And here it is. Then you're kind of looking up the hill at the curved facade. You can see that it's basically a windowless box except for your lower lobby with all its ornament. These kind of end windows that you see here are basically at the end of the circulation quarters. The windows at the top are the kind of offices and back of the house space. You can see the big office buildings and whatnot around it. Basically a party wall to your left. Next slide. Oops, another side plan. Keep going. A detail then of that entrance. Uh, the kind of holding the street facade on First Avenue, uh, right out to the sidewalk, the beginning to bend back uh, to university, the use of the kind of um, granite and terracotta ornament to create this freeze to kind of make the thing when it hits the street kind of interesting to the public in a good commercial sense, but still give it some civic symbolism, richness, and decoration. The big limestone facade, windowless, then fluted. Uh, to give it some scale and decorative detail as it goes up in a series of kind of um, half-round flutes. Next slide. 
another detail of that, the big scale opening of the main entrance uh, to give you a big shadow to read as entrance again. The ornament kind of slipping right across the front of it. The play is scale then between the ornament and the architectural opening. Next slide. What's missing is the um, hammering man, a big Borowski statue, 50 feet high. It's supposed to stand in front of the building. Uh, next slide, it kind of had an ill-fated inauguration in uh, November. Next slide. It, uh, I started to put it up on Sunday, and whoops, uh, down the hammering man came. They dropped 11 tons of steel on top of the crane. Luckily, nobody was hurt, but it did kind of bruise his hammering arm. Uh, and so he got shipped all the way back to Connecticut to get rebuilt. Basically, the arm moves very slowly. It's a big hydraulic ram, so the, the hammer and the arm are going up and down all the time. Um, and it, 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 the building really needs this because the kind of scale of this great monumental figure against this very blank box, uh, it desperately kind of needs this. Hopefully, it'll be back up by June. Next slide. A detail then of kind of looking down the street with just a fragment of the, the big letters in size up high, because you do see this building from the expressway to some extent, uh, the big scale kind of in size letters and the kind of proper letters over the entrance below. Next slide. The kind of play of all those kind of KPF office buildings and whatnot against the entry facade on, on First Street. The kind of weird kind of uh, grade conditions. You, you literally have to kind of, you know, grade is dipping so crazy around this corner that you have to kind of dive down into the entrance through a little kind of expedient stair or you go down and around at the actual corner itself. Next slide. You kind of then all the walls detailed because these are major bus stops on all these kind of, so all the walls are detailed so that people can kind of sit on them uh, in a very informal way. Also, it turns out to be the cool place to skateboard in, uh, in Seattle and mountain bike down the stairs uh, at 30 miles an hour. Uh, it's pretty dramatic. They hardly even touch from the top to the bottom. Next one. Again, the detail from outside on the sidewalk looking into the grand stair inside that connects the second street uh, lobby with the first street lobby. Next slide. Another entry detail. Next slide. This is, again, kind of the working out of the detailing of a lot of that in the office. Kind of the full-size mock-ups of the actual incising uh, of the limestone done in foam board and then some of the big scale uh, models done on the right. Next slide. Kind of looking up into those flutes that you just saw in foam core, the terracotta, the granite. Next slide. Moving around then to the side. Next slide. Then up the stairway, this is the setback stair, the outside part of the inside stair. Again, using those kind of Egyptoid columns to kind of frame the secondary entrance at the restaurant. Next slide. The play of that ornament as it changes scale from the uh, larger restaurant to the left to the typical opening to the right. Next slide. This is the second street elevation, which is much more recessive, not inflected, uh, just lines right up with all the other buildings. Uh, along 2nd Street and becomes totally two-dimensional except for a little setback where the actual door is itself and has all the service entrances as well. Next slide. That entrance looking head on early in the morning faces east as the bigger scale ornament of the entrance kind of cascades down to the service door to your right. Next slide. Here then the kind of building and plan and this series of kind of lower floor public spaces. Again, because you have literally a story and a half between the two entrances, the stair connects those halfway up that stair is the restaurant at the lower first street elevation uh, level that you can see here. You have your auditoriums uh, and, and then backup space behind them, classrooms and whatnot. Uh, up in the upper right, uh, you, in the isometric actually is a better sense of how all those spaces stack together between the lower first street and the upper second street. At the second street level, then, you have your temporary galleries, which you see on the plan number five over there. Um, and then you enter a more conventional stair and elevator system to take you up to the three levels of gallery floors above that. Next slide. 
This is the First Street Lobby uh, bookstore through that wall, information, coats, and the beginning of the uh, big uh, Chinese figures that uh, sit within the stair itself. That's one of the early sketches of the exterior elevation that they turned into, a, of Bob's, that they turned into a mural. Next one. This is the view down towards the classrooms. You're standing in the First Street entrance. The restaurant is above this lower corridor, and then the big stair taking you up uh, to the um, Second Street entrance to your right. Next slide. With you up that stair. Using some of the same ideas that we used at the National Gallery of using the arches to kind of imply the space. They're not structural, obviously. But here, done much more successfully because they allowed us to use color. Uh, and kind of make this a much more cheerful and kind of fun space. Kids really love this. They climb all over this stuff and climb up and down the stairs. It's become a very popular space in the city and also it's very beautiful at night because it all reads from the outside, obviously. Next slide. Then the upper floor is plan of the upper levels. You can see the typical plan, like six or seven. To the curved wall are your small kind of uh, smaller galleries, which are basically uh, more traditional and older art. Uh, the collection is rather poly, got a lot of Eastern stuff, very strong Eastern collection, not terribly good contemporary. Uh, but the bigger galleries to the inside are basically your contemporary uh, galleries. And then the ones to the outside are your older, um, more period room type of collections, decorative arts, etc. And then they're very carefully, the, the, the center axis down through the middle with windows at either end kind of hold those together. And then you get these cross axes that allow you to get this kind of tear and compare thing between across a couple hundred years of art from one side to the other. And then you have your basement, your you know your kind of uh, functioning office floors and all that sort of thing stacked above and below the galleries. Next slide. So it's just a big loft building for all intents and purposes. This is that kind of central curved axis with a view back to the city at both ends, looking off to the right to the big contemporary galleries to the left. Uh, the much more traditional period rooms. Next slide. This is the end of one of those axes, looking out towards the water, place to sit. And that to your right is a small resource education room that happens on every floor with the view. Um, next slide. This is the period side, the smaller galleries, your decorative arts collections. Next slide. We had much more control over the detailing of this stuff. Um, and the hanging and layout. We worked with the curators much closer than we did at the National Gallery. Here, looking at one of the European galleries out towards one of the modern galleries. Next slide. Again, in one of the modern galleries, the large scale ones. Next. Just keep going. Uh, OK, that's it. All right, great. Um, so I guess just to sum up, the, um, I mean, these two buildings, I mean, there's a lot of things similar about them. There's a lot of things different. One's very American. One's an American's interpretation of a whole set of English traditions. Uh, one's a client that, uh, you know, kind of a very close client architect relationship. The other one's a rather dicey, political, and contentious client architect situation. Uh, I mean, both buildings are successful in their own way. They certainly were, you know, kind of once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for all of us, for Bob, for sure, and for all of us that got to work on them, because they literally are the kind of buildings that most architects only get to do once in a career if they're lucky. Uh, the kind of level of detailing, the level of just everything that you do in these things uh, is pretty extraordinary and pretty much outside of normal practice. Uh, so. You know, it was a great experience. I think we'd all be fairly happy if we never have to do another art museum uh, in some ways, at least those of us that worked on it. Uh, five years or six years of your life on two big museums is probably about enough for anybody. Uh, and probably, in reality, we probably never will do another one because I have a feeling, you know, these are real showboat kind of buildings symbolically. The, the kind of clients that commission them tend to want to have their architect. And if you do two of them, that's probably all you'll ever get to do. I guess Richard Meyer has done a few more than that in Sterling. But my guess is those are probably the two that our office will ever do, except for maybe some minor, very minor stuff, museums. But certainly, in terms of major museums, I would guess that's it. Um, and, and of course, the kind of things that we all learned 
uh, you know, about the detailing of, a, of buildings like this. And, and, and in the end, I think that's really important, and none of the critics talk about, you know, is that, you know, you can, you can, theories come and go, uh, attitudes towards architecture come and go, but the kind of attention to detail, the quality that goes into these buildings, I think, uh, you have to answer that for yourself, you know, will last far beyond the petty little arguments, you know, of POMO and DECON and this and that and the other. Because these buildings, you know, most of what goes into them is really just the skill of a group of people working together for many years. You know, um, one designer, Bob, uh, you know, spending a lifetime learning how to do this stuff and then getting a chance to do it once. And, uh, and that's what will hold up over time, you know, I, I would think. Uh, in other words, you know, not whether it's modern or classical, not whether it's two-dimensional uh, or whatever, you know, uh, you like or don't like about it on that level. In point of fact, it's just like, you know, a beautifully detailed Mies building or a beautiful detailed Lutchen's building. You should be able to, uh, you know, kind of enjoy and understand those and learn from those, uh, by whatever the style is, because styles come and go, but kind of, the quality of architecture, the quality of, of kind of detailing and putting architecture together, that's a constant over time, I hope, and I hope we gave it our best. Thank you. If anybody's got any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them. Thank you. 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 Thank you.